Welcome to Girl in the Gov, the podcast. Where our goal is to make politics more accessible and less intimidating. The show features an interview with an expert in the political field, walking us through the many cues we have about politics, civics, government, and more. By providing civic education in the places we are. On our phones. And in the language we speak. And yes, we know, we say like a lot. It's kind of the point. Because politics needed a rebrand. Okay, welcome back to Girl and the Gov, the podcast. Happy Wednesday, everybody. How are we doing, Samantha? How are you doing? I hear there are some wildfires in your neck of the woods, which, like, welcome to my world. No, like, literally, I'm like, what life am I living? Like, is this, like, am I coming for your lifestyle? Is, (laughs) like, I just can't. I also just can't breathe because I have asthma, and it's just incredibly rude. I think everyone else is, like, having a little strug bus. I'm not alone on this, but it's... It's literally wild outside. It's orange. It's red. It's all the colors that I'm not a fan of that are in the sky. And (laughs) I, yeah. So anyways, I'm not sure what manager to go speak to, but I'm not pleased with this one. How are things in California? See, things in California. It's Mm. funny. So East Coast, we're feeling you guys. Sorry for the wildfires. We've been there. In California, it's been like major june gloom like it's since may too like and not just up here in northern california like southern california has been having it we've had just a very gray spring and it's been depressing okay i have a bad prediction and i was thinking about this yesterday is i think it's gonna be a really cold summer in general because Mm -hmm. although we're doing this little fire situation on the east coast right now aka the smoke coming down from canada as my nose is like running from it the level of do not doom and gloom the gloom maybe it is doom and gloom gloom. like has been happening all spring to us too like constant where i'm like where when it's like actually finally a sunny day you're like oh my god we had one on saturday thank god and i was like this is what i've been needing and then it was literally just one day and then i was like okay sick but okay yeah i don't know too it's been like there's also supposed to be a El Nino this summer on the West Coast. I don't know if it affects the East Coast, but uh, that's supposed to make things hotter. Yeah. But also, like, San Francisco always has cold win- cold summers. So, regardless, I'm sure it'll be cold here. But I'm just ready for summer weather, and it's driving me. No, especially crazy. because outfits. I literally – look, everyone hears me rant about this every single year, but I'm not going to – I'm not going to let anyone off the hook this year because I don't like winter outfits. I'm bored of them. There's too much weight. I feel claustrophobic in all the winter outfits. All my best outfits are summer. And have I been able to wear any of them? No. No, I, I haven't been able to get creative, do things. And then I just feel like, okay, well, I'm going to just be in comfy cozies because if I wear something that's warm enough for the weather, it's it's just clunky. It's chunky. It's not what I'm trying to vibe with. And for the sake of my complaining, someone give a call to Mother Nature. It's really the only thing that'll shut me up. So I know. I'll so I'm sure. I mean, it's it's good to know we're all in this together. This like shitty weather, seemingly mostly across the country. I'm sure you know the Floridas and maybe the Texases of the world are like hot and, but they're gonna get miserably hot in like the summer somewhere. But I'm sure it's beautiful somewhere. Yeah, but I spring, also but. saw that there was like some now i'm gonna totally mess this up but like in florida there was some tide thing like pushing gross things into shore oh yeah my one of my coworkers was like yeah we have toxic seaweed right now and i was like that sounds like my worst nightmare because nothing i hate seaweed i I like to eat it but i don't like like to touch it on the beach so more reason to steer clear that is a fact that is absolutely a fact underrated food seaweed salad love Mm -hmm. there are some interesting bubblings in the political world especially this presidential primary a lot of people are throwing their hat in the ring honestly across the board but two two big ones on the gop side is that former new jersey governor chris christie samantha's former governor (sighs) files his paperwork for the presidential bid and the Republican, obviously, let's clarify. And Mike Pence filed paperwork as well to challenge his former literal partner in crime. So 
So many thoughts on both of these. Mm -hmm. I'll let Samantha kick it off with the New Jersey Chris Christie thoughts because I know she's been bottling them up. Chris Christie. Do I have some thoughts on Chris Christie? Well, okay. So first of all, look, if you've read like our newsletter this week, the GovHub, you already know kind of some of my commentary. If you haven't, go get yourself subscribed. Go check out what I said. But basically, he is known for Bridgegate little scandal there with some interesting details. He's known for going and hanging out on closed beaches, you know, close to the public state on beaches. Um, He just like loves to like put his hand in a pot of controversy. And then on top of that, he just like has in thinking that he was going to be Trump's VP for a very long time. So like absolutely like, you know, figuratively sucking at his dick. And then they had a little falling out. And then he's been railing against like why Trump isn't like a fit why he shouldn't get reelected and whatnot and making like a i don't even call it a secondary career like he said many careers in his political lifespan but a whole you know quote unquote fresh wave but i feel like for me for me it's really hard to like remove him from all of the past bs like i don't feel like he's really carved a new path for himself. Like I still think of Chris Christie, not just in the NJ stuff that if you like live in NJ or tri-state, like you're like, oh my God, I like Chris Christie. I can't like that whole Michigan's, but also just the way that he was involved with the Trump drama at the beginning of the Trump administration. Like no, that still is like flopped like a fish out of yeah. water. But honestly, like know. most Republicans have because they've had to, they've had to been like, oh, tr- like when Trump first announced very back in the day, People are like, oh, no, fuck this guy. And then he gains popularity and they're like, do we need to start talking like this man and adopting his policy ideas and stances? He wins. Then everyone's on board with Trump. You know, he does crazy things. They kind of are like, do we stand up against? It's like the whole GOP has kind of had to walk this Trump line, obviously, and flip flop all the time. But Chris Christie is major flip flopper on that front. But I feel like he has emerged a little bit like mid to post Trump. As like a, he's trying to be like that kind of more traditional Republican option and like the common sense guy. Will that work for him? I'm not sure. But I think that is the brand he has in recent years been trying to become. He's definitely been trying to and like going back, but it's like, I don't know. And this is what I like think of as interesting across the board for Republicans, like even say in the future past this particular election cycle, we're like... The Trump factor, maybe not the Trump factor doesn't exist. It'll have a different form, but say Trump is no longer on this earth. It's like, what what happens then? Like, how do these Republicans, you know, scurry their way back to what they say are their roots? And I just don't buy it. I don't know if like someone that's a little further away from dealing with politics all the time maybe feels a little bit differently, but it's like not to like quote Bloomberg that like at the DNC forever ago but it's like or like a New Yorker can see right through your bullshit like it's just like it's not it doesn't sell I mean maybe it sells to someone but it doesn't sell I mean it's also they just hope people like have short memory and like memory spans and attention spans to be like oh like how is he presenting himself now and then like most people can maybe forget I don't know but I don't want to talk about Mike Pence because I this one is just like so crazy to me because you know he is going to walk a very interesting line given that he has recently kind of stood up and out against Trump but like he also you know kind of touts the accomplishments of the Trump administration but then like wants to bring the GOP like back to you know that establishment like traditional Republican brand so i'm like which one is it and like which one is he going to really take on and then also he's going up against trump so he's going to have to completely make a contrast or i mean i may if he can do it perfectly he can almost be like the best of both worlds for the republican voters who like liked some trump stuff but like didn't like all the craziness so it could be a genius move or there's part of it where i'm like this doesn't make any sense to me i can't figure it out yeah because i have like there's like the Trump voters, like they're going to be Trump voters, like the hardcore Trump voters. And I think they look at him as like a, a total seller. Enemy now. Yeah. yeah. 
Right. So it's like they were trying to hang the man. Yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> Jan- on January 6th. Never forget. No one, no one forget, please. So I just, you know, him trying to walk the line, like maybe he does walk the line enough to get some sides of that. But like, is that enough of the vote share though to actually get him ahead? And then here's some interesting scenarios though, right? Because say Trump gets the nomination, God help us all. Who's the VP pick this time around? Is it Mike Pence round two? Probably or not. Is it like Ron I think DeSantis, it's like p- power move, like combined forces? I don't think so. I think it'll be someone he thinks he can boss around in some regard and someone that gets like a different audience. And I saw that he was particularly kind, kind being a relative role, word in Trump world, but to Tim Scott entering the race and was like welcoming him into the race in a friendly way. And I feel like if you're a Trump, you only do that if you have some type of like- That's very true. Plan, thought, whatever. I also, to back to the Chris Christie, like if Trump wins the nomination and is picking a VP and he picked Chris Christie, you can guarantee that Chris Christie is going to say, up. Trump and me are buddy buddies. So like- Yeah. I just also think that's know. an interesting question of- this growing GOP field. It's like, okay, if you were then picked for VP by either Trump or DeSantis, are you doing it? Mm -hmm. And there's such like a divide in the party versus whereas like in 2020 with, you know, the democratic primary field, it's like everyone's pretty much up there saying the same thing, like having the same kind of policy stances and everything. Like no one's really beefing up there. Like it's kind of, there's like yeah, small di- smaller differences between each candidate. Whereas this Republican primary, there's going to be like major differences, and they're all going to try and like stand out from each other, and there's going to be a lot of tension and beef. So, yeah, but usually like people do pick a- other like presidential primary candidate to bring in as VP in the general. So, yeah, and it yeah to see Trump like actually welcome someone to the race was so bizarre. I was like. Yeah. What? Where did this come from? So mm-hmm. it's a good call. Thank you. But, Thank you for my moments. But yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see who else. Bobson, I know a former governor of North Dakota is announcing this year, or not this year, this week. Mm-hmm. I was like, I don't know who this dude is. I'll be perfectly honest. Remember but, when I saw Mike Pence in the Chicago airport on the way over? I was like, I totally forgot about that. Was that? It was like he was surrounded by all these like Secret Service dudes. So I was just like walking to my next gate like rushing and all of a sudden i see this like white haired oh, short yeah. man in a suit and i was like he looks familiar and i was like wait a second i think he was my vice yeah. president but yeah craziness we also had cornell west announced not as a democrat but as a the independent people party he's like an activist he's like always on bill maher he's kind of like a thought leader type guy i put i put the his campaign video in the Geneva. It's actually like an incredible little video, but he's not running as Democrat. He's running, I think it's called the independent people party or whatever, but yeah, it's it's just things are heating up. So we will keep everyone updated, but we do have an episode we do to get into an interview to get into. So Samantha do the honors. I will do the honors. Thank you so much. We have West Virginia delegate Kayla Young on this week, and we got into so many things. This Yet again, I say this every time. There are so many more rabbit holes. It could have gone down, and it's just true. So if you have questions about what West Virginians think of Joe Manchin, this episode is mm, going to cover that. that if you're curious about Jim Justice and all his scandalousness and his run for Senate, we do cover that as well. Do we get into just the whole wide scale of what West Virginia politics look like? Why there also aren't more women in office there? All of those things. Yeah, well, we do. And in addition to that, we talk about funding childcare and how that connects to the economy and families. And then we also talk about child marriage and Caleb getting that law passed this past session in West Virginia and all of the antics that went along with that, that again, connect to the larger picture of what politics are like in West Virginia. So then loss. without further ado, here is Caleb. 
We're so excited to have you on Girl on the Go the podcast. For those that don't know, we have Kayla Young here. She is a delegate from West Virginia, and she's going to roll us through all the West Virginia antics, all the politics, all the background, her story and getting into politics and all that. So first things first, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Of course. Well, you know, let's get right into it. Can you tell us about your political journey, how you ended up in elected office? Like, what did that look like for you? Where did that sort of inspiration start? You're like, you know what? I'm going to run for office. I'm going to run for delegate. This is how it all rolled. It's a very windy path, as I think most people's are. And honestly, it should be, right? Like, I don't want the same boring people there. So it's a very windy path. In college, I started studying fashion design, changed my mind halfway through, switched to political science. I don't even remember why, but switched to political science, went that route, then went to grad school for marketing and kind of like forgot for a while. Then I decided to have kids. I moved back to West Virginia to raise my kids in West Virginia because it was too damn expensive to raise them anywhere else. My family was here and wanted to be near family. Never thought I'd move back home, but did. And I've been back for 10 years and I couldn't be happier. But then there were a couple of things that kind of got me back into politics. The first one was my son was born in January, January 2nd of 2014. Like three to five days later, I don't remember because I was like fresh out of surgery, new mom, crazy brain. We had a water crisis. There was a tank along the river that was a few miles up from the water intake that leaked into the river. It smelled like Red Bull, you know, that horrible Ooh. smell. And <laughs> so like, everybody was like, Bull? I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah, everybody was like, hey, why why does the faucet smell like Red Bull? What the hell's happening? We realized that a chemical that was a coal cleaning agent was stored right along the river, had been spilling into the river, got into our water supply. We didn't have water for 21 days. Oh, my God. And I had a brand new baby at the time. And so we were like, what the hell's going on? We have to do something. So I got kind of back into politics because of that, a little bit of activism, but still not a ton. And then when Donald Trump was elected in 16, I was like, oh no, what, <laughs> what, are we, yeah. this, we can't, I've got two kids, like we, oh no, no, no. So I got way back into it, Women's March, went and did the whole thing, and then started a nonprofit that was at like, kind of girl bossy, it, at the time seemed like the best idea, but looking back, I'm like, oh, not really the best way to go about this, but that's okay. And got back into community organizing and that way, and then started lobbying for environmental issues. So came right back into the water crisis stuff with one of my best friends, Karen, and then was sitting in committee meetings and was like, I'm I'm sick of asking these people to do things. They're not doing what I want them to do. I'm just going to run. And so ran won my first term, it was 2020. So it was COVID, which was insane in itself. And now I'm in my second term, halfway through it. Incredible. Also, wild. just I was thinking, I was like, whoever is drinking Red Bull, Red Bull still, just please let that soak in that the water crisis, things were, were coming out of the faucet, were smelling like Red Bull. So just that we don't right. want those chemicals enough take that as a hit to the Red Bull brand immediately. Yeah. There's just something off about that taste. I don't know like what it is that like it's really chemicals. sends me. Yeah. It's chemicals. yeah. That's fair. But <laughs> yeah. nonetheless, what an exciting journey and can totally relate of like sort of like doing the politics element in college and then being like, oh, we go into marketing PR, that element. Yeah. And then making your way back because that's kind of what happened to me. It's obviously a different fashion, but I'm glad to see like not the only person that went into sort of the marketing comm side and then made like a U-turn back to it. So very right. cool to see that. It's never but great late. skills to have, mm -hmm. right? Like totally. it, they're perfect for politics, honestly. So great. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Well, can you tell us a little bit more about this role as delegate in West Virginia? Can you kind of explain what the role entails, a day in the life perhaps? And also we're always curious too with some of these roles. Is it full-time? Is it part-time? I know it varies by state. So give us that rundown. Yeah, so super varies by state. I think when I was elected, I didn't realize a lot of other states don't call it delegate. So first of all, there's only three states. It's for 
Virginia, Maryland, and West Virginia that say delegate. And that's because we were, you know, we used to be part of Virginia. So that's just super old fashioned. And all the other states say like assembly person or house representative, which is kind of a mouthful. So I kind of prefer delegate. But <laughs> so in West Virginia, it's a short term part-time legislature. We only meet 60 days a year. We go from the second week in January and that's 60 calendar days. So like that includes Saturday and Sunday. It is oh, well, okay. so, so short. So mm -hmm. it's two months essentially that we're in full time doing everything. January, February, March, we kind of like start the year and it's like a whirlwind. And then we all joke that at the end, then like we actually start normal life and we like have the normal year. So everybody has other jobs. I I I find myself curious as to whether a full time or part time is better and what kind of people you get for both situations. And I don't know yeah. the answer. With us, you kind of you have to have another job because it pays twenty thousand dollars a year to be in the house. And but you have to have a job that's flexible to let you take two months off. And then also like if the governor calls us in or we call ourselves in, you you got to go be there. I'm in the capital city. So that's incredibly convenient. But we have people that have to drive five or six hours and transportation. We don't like have planes that even go to these other places. And so like they're driving like five hours yeah. each way. So it's it's part time. We all have regular jobs and it's just kind of a whirlwind. It's nice because I get to go home at night, but it's also horrible that I have to go home at night and like. I love that I get to see my kids every day, but it's also really hard that I can't focus on just that work. So yeah. I always wonder like, what's the best scenario here? And I, I don't know that there even is one. Yeah. Logistically, yeah. that sounds rough. Yeah, totally. I was thinking about that recently as well, because for Vermont, it's similar where it's like a part-time scenario. And I know they yeah. just passed a legislator pay bill, which I don't think even goes into effect till 2025 anyways, yeah. but Regardless, like the idea of trying to bring more people into it and seeing like some of these reps, like being like, okay, we're going to get pulled into a special session mm -hmm. and I'm taking media in between my meetings for my like other job and like trying to see that balance. And I think I, I do wonder, you know, like how effective that is or how much more effective it could be if everyone were doing it full time and really we're getting paid adequately mm -hmm. and therefore could really just zo like zoom in on that and make that right. their full job. But then you see people in like federal Congress, yeah. that it's their full time job and they absolutely shit the bed. So right. you, know, you got the arguments yeah. there. And it's like the intention too of like what why you're there is also kind of yeah highlighted when it's part time versus full time because some people are in for like, you know, a career, which is mm -hmm. fine, but obviously that comes with certain types of intentions as to why you're doing the work versus part time. Like you're not doing it for the money or for whatever. It's like you're hopefully doing it for the right reasons. So it's interesting too to like see that difference. Yeah. I always I it's I don't know what the answer is, but we just yeah. passed a pay bill too. And like, it's the, our pay bill is like pennies on the dollar, but it's also like, but we're not raising the minimum wage. So why should we get a raise? And most of the people in there are wealthy anyways. They're mostly retired. They're mostly wealthy. Yeah. Because you kind of have to be have or to have be. another job that's like weird. There, mm -hmm. There's not a lot of normal people in the, yeah. that are elected, period. Totally. Yeah, you right. must have to have like a seasonal job. Like my dad works he's like a landscape arctic and like the majority of the season starts like mm -hmm. mid spring through like right before Christmas really. And like, like that honestly my dad could remember Ravis because you got that seasonal element and very specific and is totally offline from those months that they're off. So like there's yeah. jobs but it's not it's so specific it's so random like how you like actually navigate that and think about it is kind of wild. But I also know another element of this whole conversation about like who's doing the job also does include gender here in like West Virginia and oh, yeah. that it's super male dominated, like next level. Like yep. when I was looking through like, okay, who's an elected in West Virginia, what that looks like at each level. I was like, Holy shit. This is next level male dominated. Yeah. And I'm curious from your perspective, why, not just why that is, you know, we can like look at that broadly nationally, but in West Virginia, like what really pushes that status quo not to break at all? It's so weird. And I think we're just old school. It's wild because we now have, well, we have three Congress people, but going down to two in this next election. No, we went to two. We went to two. We only have two now. And one's a woman. Carol Miller is our Congresswoman. And then in the Senate and federally, we have Manchin and we have Capito. So we have a man and a woman. I think we're 
maybe one of the last states that has one of each party also. I don't know that a lot of states have one of each party, but we do. And so we have one woman federally. We've never had a woman governor ever. The city I live in, the capital, Charleston, I'm in South Charleston, but Charleston has its first woman mayor ever. And then in the legislature, we have the youngest, we have the least amount of women of any legislature in the country. We have 13 women out of 134. And one of them just resigned like last week to take another job. So now we're down to 12. So like 12 out of 134. I will be in committee meetings where I'm the only woman in the room. Or Mm -hmm. I'll walk into committee meetings where there's no women in the room and be like, y'all couldn't get like one woman on this committee. Like we, I understand you like are trying to fit the committees to be certain makeups, but like, is that, is thinking about gender, like not part of it, Yeah. but most of the staff are women. Like I'm Mm -hmm. in this group chat. That's all staff, both parties by camera, both sides of the legislature, that it's all the staff of the women. And then I'm in it because they're all my friends because those are the people (laughs) I spend time with. And I'm like, thanks for letting me in the group chat, guys. Like, I don't know what you're talking about most of the time because our jobs are very different, but like, they're still my closest friends. But it's insane. Like my caucus has, we only have two women in my caucus, period. There's only 12 of us, period. And then there's only two women. So I don't know why it's so low. I think part of it is that a lot of women can't take the time to run for office because they're, you know, running the running the world basically without getting the credit for it. But I think childcare is a huge piece, all of it. I don't know. I think it's horrible though. I wish Mm -hmm. I'm always constantly trying to like find women to run for office because I think a lot of the times people don't think about women when they're thinking about who to ask to run for office. And it's like, I'm leading with that because that's what I want. Women get shit done. So that's what I want. Sure. We couldn't agree more over here. So Well, speaking of West Virginia and all the things, we want to talk about kind of what the political landscape looks like there. (laughs) You guys are famous for someone called Joe Manchin. That's one thing I'm sure we'll get into. But even beyond that, looking at, you know, the state legislature and what does it what does it look like? What does it feel like politically there? bad okay so I was elected a lot of things that people outside of West Virginia don't know is that we were democratically run for 85 years so we were democrat all all the way for 85 years that just flipped in 2014 so less than 10 years less than 10 years ago there was at one point where our senate has 34 members one it was 20 years ago 34 members of the Senate. It, there were 33 Dems and one Republican, a woman. She's been there since before I was born. She was the only member of the Republican caucus for several years. One person. Oh, now it's 31 three the other way. So, I mean, we have totally gone upside down in the last 10 years, which is wild. I think most that was all like right after Obama. I don't think West Virginia was ready for Obama for a number of reasons, coal being the biggest one, but race also being another big one. And and the the Democrats that we had in West Virginia, and I'm a Democrat, were not the kind of Democrats that we think about nationally today. They were way, way, way more like Joe Manchin. So very moderate. They probably wouldn't be considered Democrats now for the most part. The political landscape is wild here. When I was elected in 2020, my caucus went from 40 members to 20 members. And then this last election, it went from 20 members to 11 members. So we have gotten cut in half every cycle for like the last three cycles. And and they've taken advantage of this super majority. And now it's like a super duper majority because it's 88, 11 and they do whatever they want. They run trans, anti-trans bills. They We have basically a full abortion ban. They've done a ton of tax stuff. Like everything they can do, they have done in the last like three years. So it is it has been rough for progressive people at all in West Virginia. Uh, the people who stay in there like and tough it out with that small, small number you guys have, the Democrats so across country. We've talked to people like in Louisiana who have the same type of scenario. And I'm like, for you to stay there with, you know, an 80 to 11, just applaud, applaud you because that's just got to be so rough, but it's, it's necessary for people to like stay in there, tough it out. Yep. But wow, that's got to be a lot. 
It's a lot, but you really have to kind of like redefine what a win is, right? Because it's mm -hmm. like, you're never going to win, but what can we do to make things less horrible? And it's yeah. like, oh, well, you know, like we're not happy about this, but if we can make something a <clears throat> little less bad, then that's a big deal. And most of the stuff happens all behind the scenes that like, you know, because yeah. we yeah. are here and we build relationships and it's like not things we can campaign on, but that's like yeah. where most of the work is. Yeah. Right. Like it's almost like to... playing buffer. Like it's like you're literally or yeah. defense. You're like, okay, like yeah. can't shoot them all down, but like at least we can block a few of the the passes. Yeah. But yeah. keeping those relationships and making sure there's at least some people in the room that can counter them on their opinions and their policies just so, to keep having those conversations is so crucial to just continue to push push on them a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. I also think too, like what's been really interesting this past <laughs> year, and I'm curious like your take on this as well, is like we've just actually seen so much more of a focus on clip, like clips, which sounds so funny, coming out of state politics. And I feel like it's been a great service to people, especially those that aren't necessarily typical voters, seeing that, oh, like these are the conversations happening on the House floor. These are what like politicians are actually saying and the accountability of it and then having representatives like you like countering it and actually like saying things back and you're seeing this dialogue actually take place and I just feel like I don't know if it's like I'm more dialed into it or what but I just feel like this past year there's been a lot more accountability available I mean, not accountability because obviously that would mean that like an action stopped but someone actually putting their toes to the fire that's too. yeah yeah Oh, yeah. Mm. I think about like Megan Hunt, right? She's just like, I'm going to burn it down. Yeah. And people because sometimes that's the only option there is. Mm -hmm. For sure. Totally. We actually had our friend Shiva on who's on school board in Boise. And he we I forget exactly we asked him and he was like, burn it down. Just burn <laughs> it down. And we're like, there. there it is. But yeah. sometimes you have someone... to. <laughs> A thousand yeah. percent. It's like or your at only least option. Bring that energy at least, you know, obviously the literal like literal burn it down is is different but to you know have someone who brings that energy and like actually is there doing that work is is so important they bring totally. it well speaking of someone that likes to burn it down but like not necessarily in a positive way we've got joe mansion <laughs> and we're curious what the perspective on him is in the state he's like such an enigma national it's like him and kirsten cinema you're like oh my god what now so i'm curious what's like the the pov on him in actual west virginia supposed to nationally it's interesting it's interesting so like i grew up here and when i was growing up he was in the house he was in the senate he like statewide he then became the secretary of state then he was the governor when i was growing up and so like we're all used to this and it where everybody has a mansion story and it, so like we were like oh now the rest of the country gets to see that he's the guy actually doing all the stuff and so the the mindset changes a lot it's very varied in general people have always really liked him here always and then i think i think he became the center of the universe after what was that 2020 and then he was like kind of a de facto guy right like he was kind of the one doing everything in 2021 i feel like he was kind of the center of the universe i think that's lessened a little bit now until you know now we're dealing with the debt ceiling this past week and he's all about the mvp pipeline something i don't support but like he got that into the debt ceiling bill and like me as an environmentalist have a huge problem with that. But then he yeah. and I work together on a ton of stuff. So he's been really good about bringing money back to West Virginia, just like our former Senator Robert C. Byrd, you know, the longest sitting Senator of all time. And he kind of went into that seat. And so he's kind of the center, but now it's getting interesting because he was okay. Jim justice is our current governor. He was elected as governor, as a Democrat, he was Joe Manchin's pick. A year later, he switched. Trump came to West Virginia. Jim Justice switched parties. Like when Trump was there, it was a whole big thing. And we were all like, hey, what the hell's going on? Yikes. I've, I've never been a Jim Justice fan politically. I think he's a, it's weird. It's just a weird time. He's like a Trump guy where 
Trump guy in the way of like, he was just a businessman. He owns the Greenbrier, the resort, which is like this yeah. super famous, beautiful resort that he bought and like saved from bankruptcy. But then turns out like he's a garbage businessman. He's like defaulted on, he owns a bunch of coal mines. He's getting sued like every single day for never paying his bills. But he's the governor. Then he got this dog. Her name is Baby Dog. And she's this very, you have to look her up. She's this very cute mm -hmm. little English bulldog that he got, but then has taken it so far to like, we always say she's a puppet because like everybody loves her, but then they like, it makes them forget about the horrible things he's doing. And they're just like, oh, but where's baby dog? And we're like, please stop using this dog like this. I My love God. English please. bulldogs, but yeah. the name baby dog is not acceptable to me. <laughs> but Our, what is that? Our state's vaccine campaign was called Do It for Baby Dog. Oh, gosh. Hold, please. Gosh, I actually is. have right here. Do It for Baby oh, Dog. <laughs> this just happens to be sick. It's like, it's not a joke, right? It's insane. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, um, baby if dog. people got vaccinated because of her, great. But um, yeah, right. please leave this dog alone. Like, let her just eat chicken nuggets and live her life. But, yeah. okay, back to the story. Jim Justice is our governor. Jim Justice has now decided he's termed out. He's now decided to run for Senate against Joe Manchin. And so a poll came out yesterday that he's up like 23 points or something. So now we're like, oh, God. And we don't know what Manchin's doing. Nobody yeah. knows. I get calls from around the country every day like, so what's he going to do? And I'm like, I, I don't know. Your guess is right. as good as mine. Is he going to run for president? Is he going to run for Senate? Is he going to come back and run for governor? I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Oh my gosh. That would be a really if he's down move. a bunch of points, then he's going to be pushed into some other yeah. move, which the whole presidential one is one that scares the shit out of us. But I also just that. something we always talk about whenever Joe Manchin is in the news and just talking about kind of West Virginia is that we're always so curious, like what the electorate is like, because both like Joe Manchin and Jim Justice seem to have a very similar story as far as just like flip-flopping between parties and it's just like that just makes me wonder like okay well what are the people of West Virginia where are they at because it seems like you know they're electing Democrats here and there but then have more conservative views so I'm just so I've always been so curious about that because it seems to be such a like anomaly there it is. It is. Definitely is. I mean, it's interesting because coal has kind of driven everything for the past 150 years. Like we always say West Virginia built the entire country because of the coal that we created. And but the coal companies kind of came in and treated everybody really poorly and they gave them money. It wasn't real money. It was monopoly money and made them live in housing. And but at the same time, everybody loves coal and they yeah. like it's 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 like an abusive relationship almost it's like totally. they love it and it's completely decimated the entire state and we have next to nothing to show for it because we In didn't invest world. any of the money that we got it worked and then the coal companies just decide to close or go bankrupt because they they do business poorly and they just like leave the town and the people are completely screwed and right and there's like no other options and then you'll have these like big big Silicon Valley tech firms that'll come in and be like we're gonna teach you guys how to code and we're like what the hell People don't want to do that. Like, so we're yeah. trying to figure out ways to to keep these communities alive and have dignity and include them in those conversations. But in general, the electorate is like fairly moderate. Like most people here, which I would assume is like rural places anywhere. We're very rural, but I would assume that most places like people are just trying to get through the day. Like they are just trying to live their life, raise their family. They don't really care about most of the things that politicians talk about, because why yeah. should they? Most of the things that we talk about anyways are stupid. Like whatever Fox News has decided, like is the most pressing issue of the day. And it's like, is it? Do, what the hell is critical yeah, race like, that theory? Like, like to it, me. it's yeah. not. Yeah. You don't care. You only care because they told you to care. And so that's right. people on both sides, like talking about the issues. But in general, like people like to be left alone and live their life and they don't want to deal with this stuff so mm -hmm. i mean the national media has really like driven everything which i would assume is pretty much everywhere but all of our people who are young and smart and progressive most of them are leaving because there's not a ton of opportunities and they're going to big cities where it's already super blue and i don't want to be like don't leave please stay here because yeah. we need you 
I get why they're leaving though, because for a lot of people, it's not safe. You know, if they're LGBTQ or women, like why the hell would they stay there? They don't have autonomy over their own bodies. I don't blame them, but, but we can't get, we can't start changing things until those people are here. So it's hard. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's a circle. It's literally a circle. It is. I'm curious too, from a jobs and economy perspective, what you think would be the type of like jobs or investment in West Virginia communities that people would be excited about or interested in? Because I totally, like, I am not a math girl. Neither of us are. The idea of coding, I think I took actually, we had like a postgrad coding availability like class and I took yeah. it for like a day and I was like, immediately no, like I just could not give less shits yeah, and same. I just couldn't get into it. And so I totally get that. No interest in a tech job. So I'm curious what would be something that would just be more of a fit? That's a good question. And that's kind of what we're facing. There's a lot of things. So like, we know that we want to continue to be an energy state. And so we are making investments in like battery manufacturing. That's one that is like adjacent to blue collar jobs that people have had and want to keep. Nuclear energy is something that I'm super interested in. And it's something that really splits the environmental communities. But I'm very, very for it. We had a ban on nuclear energy a couple of years ago and that we lifted the ban on ener nuclear energy. And so that's something that we're starting to look at, like advanced reactors. That's something Manchin and I actually super agree on and have worked really closely on to get, we had Bill Gates here last year to get, or that was this year, to get, to talk about using our coal fired power plants that have closed or are closing to switch them to nuclear to keep the jobs there. It, it's zero carbon. So I super, super support it. And we're going to need way more energy on the grid in the future when everything's electrified. People People are like, how do we keep how do we keep the one to one? And it's like, oh, no, it's like four to one. We're going to need way more energy when everybody has electric vehicles. And so that's one that I think is really interesting. Also, I think child care. That's like my number one thing is I think the first state that has free child care for everyone, regardless of income, will be the state that young families flock to because child care mm -hmm. costs more than college and you can't <clears throat> go to work if you don't have it. So for me, I'm like, why has nobody done, why has nobody done this? So that's what I'm trying to do. I think that will be it. And then people like if they're remote workers, which we know that tons of people are remote workers now that they'll be able to, they'll be able to do this. They'll mm -hmm. be able to live here and get free childcare and still do their jobs. Totally. No, I love it. So smart. Well, this is like the perfect segue because we wanted to talk to you about childcare in West Virginia, getting it funded, what it looks like. I know that this, the models look different per state and what different legislators, legislatures, oh my gosh, are exploring. And so if you could paint that picture for us as to what childcare looks like in West Virginia currently, and then also talk about some of the solutions, that'd be amazing. Yeah. So I think it's the same. I think all the states have the same same problem with child care. It's, it seems like universal and like everybody does it. Okay. We're like we're all doing it the best we can, but there are so many improvements that we can make. We've never had, you or we've only had universal child care in this country one time. I wish that there would be a federal solution, but we tried during build back better and it doesn't seem to be happening at all. During world war II, there was free child care for people so women could go work in the factories. It's a less known fact, but it was a thing that occurred and I they got rid of it at the end of the war. And I think it's probably the worst decision we've ever made, one of them, because why would you not? Like the first thousand days of a child's life are without a doubt the most important mentally. So like these are our future leaders. Why would we not be educating them the best that we can in the first thousand days of their life? But also so their parents can go to work, right? This is a twofold problem. The problem that we're having in West Virginia is the same problem everywhere where it's insanely expensive for people to take their kids to childcare. Like the cheapest option is like 200 bucks a week for a child. That is very, very expensive. That's like over a week of someone's salary typically for a middle income job. But the other end is that it's incredibly expensive to run a childcare facility and the people getting paid should be t educated as teachers and certified to be child care educators. But typically, they're just looking for like, whatever. So most people are at their wits end. And they're just like, I just need somebody to watch my kid. I don't care if it's quality, like, 
quality mm -hmm. would be great. And people that can afford it can afford it, but most people can't. And then there's not even enough slots for anybody. So it's building an infrastructure where the teachers are being paid adequately. So then they're not leaving and going to become like real, not real teachers, but teachers in primary schools. It's considering childcare the same way we consider elementary education, which is everybody should be there. They should all be learning. It should be fully funded by the government. So, so we're doing the best things possible. So it's making sure that that the centers are having enough money so they can open more spots and that their their income is stable and there's really easy ways to do that it's it's paying for subsidies based on enrollment versus attendance like this is an easy one that every state has this problem where right now if you have a subsidized child a kid that's on like government assistance for childcare the center only gets paid on the days that the kid shows up not the days that they're, they're enrolled to be there so it's like well, if they don't come, guess what? The center still has all the same operating costs and they're just not getting paid. So like, that's the easiest thing to do. Just start to make things easier. During the pandemic, every, we, there was so much money poured into childcare and people have been able to expand their facilities. They've been able to pay their workers better, but that's starting to end. And so the more we can do to help the centers be stable and stay open and expand, the better, but also to make it more affordable for parents on the other end. So it's a huge problem. But the time that somebody is just like, we're just going to put the damn money in and we're going to pay for it so people can have childcare. That's the solution. Yeah. What are the biggest hurdles that you are seeing with, you know, getting this fun and getting, making this a reality? Like where are your colleagues at on it? What's the temperature? What's the deal there? They're coming around. The Honestly, it was great. The pandemic was like really great for this. Be, it, it, the pandemic was horrible, but in a lot of ways, it shined a light on some Probably really effects. important things. Yeah. And people are starting to finally see childcare as infrastructure and that it's vital for our economy. So that's a good thing. We're starting to get places. We we There's tons of outside groups that are coming in to help mobilize the centers to, to get the people that own the childcare centers to be able to talk to legislators because they're busy, man. They're running their centers. They, they don't have time to come and advocate at the Capitol, but they've realized how important it is to do so. And so they're starting to do so. We just had child care day at the legislature this year for the first time ever. And it was great. So we're starting to move in that direction. But and people are starting to realize even conservatives are starting to realize this is something we have to do because we have the lowest workforce participation in West Virginia in the country. And it's like, why are only half the people that can work working? And there's a million answers for that. But the answer we consistently hear is child care. And so it's like, even when we're trying to bring giant companies to West Virginia for economic development, they say, what, what are the schools like? What's the child care like? And what's the cost of living? Cause it's like, they can't, they can't bring people here if those people can't go to work. So we just have right. to make it as easy as possible for people to work. And at the same time, educating children who are going to be our future. Totally. Well, that actually a no brainer. Yeah, it, totally. It's like, Economics 101, first of all, but second to that, I think the teaching equation in it is kind of interesting because we don't pay our teachers adequately in this country. Yep. And I'm curious if you see like a connection or an arch between those two. Like if like we were paying our teachers better and we were more on top of that and prioritizing that, would the child care situation already be handled? You know, like I hope is so. there a bridge there? I think you know, so. I just yeah. Yeah, I think there's a bridge that goes a couple ways. Like a lot of people that are, they work at childcare centers that don't have any formal training, then decide to be teachers. So it's hard to keep the people in honestly either of the positions, but the people are going from the childcare centers to become teachers, which is a great pipeline, but we need to make sure that there's enough money for both of these jobs to be like fully funded. So if people want to stay in those jobs, they can. They're leaving them because they can't afford to stay where they are in both situations. So they're leaving childcare to become a teacher because they can't afford to live on being a childcare teacher. So then they become a regular elementary school or secondary school teacher, and then they can't afford that. So then they end up leaving that also. But it would also just help with like, handling the temperament of children because the children would be much more equipped and much more ready for school. Yeah. 
That's that so true. is seems easy. Very true. <laughs> I remember I had my elementary school and this is like obviously forever ago, not to like totally age myself, but (laughs) the kindergarten, the way that my town had worked that we were living in was that they would essentially do a lottery system of who went to which elementary school. So it was like trying to diversify the town, which was great. But you had a really interesting mix in the kindergarten of who had gone to pre-K and who hadn't. And it made it really difficult for the teacher because there were some of us that had been really blessed and able to go to pre-K and were academically and just emotionally behaviorally ahead of the other kids and so trying to handle both of those at the same time it just made it like you really needed two teachers you're teaching two different types of classes yeah and so I couldn't agree more just having experienced that and seeing that actually you know happen it would just be it would be great to see that and great for everyone around so like let's definitely get some child care funded what is the current status in West Virginia right now in terms of child care funding and where do you think it's headed It's low and we have funded it less over the years, like this enrollment versus attendance debate. It's like very low minutia and it's very boring, but we asked in committee, we had this in a committee hearing, which was wonderful. Like we haven't gotten a committee hearing on this ever. And we finally did like a year ago and now we've done it a second year. But I said, well, how much money do we have? How much do we fund it? It's like 10 million, which is not that much. And I was like, okay, well, what if everybody shows up? Like right now we are, we're sending out the money based on the attendance. So like, but we, but we have all these slots for all these kids. We just know that they don't show up all the time. So like, what happens if they show up and they're like, oh, then we can't afford it. And it's like, so we we're we're underfunding it is what you're telling me like that we just aren't giving it enough money and it would only be like 4 million more so i it's this is crazy completely yeah. crazy completely crazy and but just so necessary to get this get this through but yeah an interesting deep dive on on child care that we needed But we wanted to move into another chunk of questions that we have, which is around child marriage. Not really a topic I ever saw myself needing to talk about on this show, but we it's a reality we need to talk about an issue that you legislated this session. Can you first explain like what child marriage is? Is there a standard definition we can look to and maybe just kick off like why we're even talking about this today? Yeah, never something I thought I would have to spend this much energy on in my life, but it has been the last two years of dealing with child marriage. So child marriage is when someone under the age of 18 is married. There, It looks different in a lot of states because, you know, legally, you are an adult at 18 years old. You cannot sign a contract unless you're emancipated until you're 18 years old. You can't get a bank account by yourself. You can't sign a lease by yourself. You legally cannot do a lot of things until you're 18. So this is the impetus for saying you should be 18 years old when you're getting married because you can't even sign a contract. You can't get divorced. You can't get away if you need to. You can't even go to any sort of like shelter for unhoused people because you're a child and they don't want to be responsible for children, which... I fully understand. So you can't do any of these things till you're 18. This Somebody brought this to me and they said, West Virginia has the highest statistic of child marriage in the country. And I was like, wait, what? And it's it was like seven out of every 1,000, every 1,000 was the highest in the country. And so I was like, well, got to change that because that's disgusting. And it's because we're a very small state and our we border Maryland, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee, and, and Virginia, duh. And they not... Tennessee? I don't know. Whatever. We have a couple of border states and, and people live on them. And so they can come over the border and have people married. They can get married to children. So our law in West Virginia was if you were 16 or 17, you could get married with parental consent. Sounds okay. But there's a lot of people who want to get rid of their children. And so they were marrying them off to the highest bidder, literally. Oh my God. Then if you were under 16, you could get married if a judge signed off on it. The really disgusting part is that there was no floor, like, at all. At all. So, I mean, oh you God. could be a day old. And if a judge decided they you want should be married, did that happen? No, 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 no. Right. But there was no floor. And that's disgusting. Yeah. So we started this fight to say it needs to be 18, no exception. There are several national organizations that work on this also. And they've been doing it nationwide. And Pennsylvania actually became 
a state, they signed it into law, like I think last year. So there are states moving towards 18. Most states are somewhere in the middle, which is also like, why, why? And yeah, then what it actually that? ends up coming down to is like very conservative people who think if you're pregnant, you should be married. But all of these statistics okay. show that even if you are, even if you do get married because you're pregnant, your outcomes are still worse. You're still economically more off. You're more likely to be abused. It's, it's bad. Nothing is better just because you're married. So we decided to start this fight a couple years ago. I introduced the bill of Republican who is the chair of Senate Judiciary introduced it on his side. Great guy. And so we, we introduced it, didn't go anywhere. Then this last year it started moving and it was this like, it was the most insane series of events that happened, but we did get the law passed. It's not the version that I, I don't love what we ended up with, but it's a start and it's going to protect a lot of people. So now, now if you're 16 or 17, you can marry somebody up to four years older than you uh, with parental consent. So it's a little safer. Okay. If it's 16, yeah. then you can marry somebody up to 20. If it's 17, you can marry somebody up to 21, but that's it. Those are the only people, nobody under the age of 16 is getting married at all. So better. That's Much better. definitely positive in the right direction and you would at least hope and i hope is a very, very like in quotations word here that if you're like 17 and you're marrying someone that's 19 maybe you're in high school together in your high school spheres like you could paint the picture i know from some of the research i've done that like most often that's like not, not the case that's not really what like the laws are trying to prevent from happening but like yeah. at least there's some it reduces some of the predatory nature of the whole yeah, yeah. kit and caboodle which I think yeah. is just like so wild. I even like related or pulling out of even the marriage conversation, just sometimes like the age gaps that I see, like my friends, I've been talking about this so much recently of guys that are our age that are now going for girls that are like 20, 21 and how creepy wow. that is. And it's like definitely it's changed like how we perceive guys that we know. We're like, ooh, interesting. Like that's red flag city. Like absolutely not. So it's just kind of like weird, these things that like, obviously exist and they don't exist in like the vacuums that sometimes you like assume that they might you like start yeah. to see it throughout yeah. your life and like what these things look like and i'm glad that these laws are making progress and i'm curious what those roadblocks look like in terms of even getting this variation on a theme passed like what were those conversations like i can just see like the the just on the floor, probably some of these like probably conservative men being like, but this love story, let me tell you about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, their own, their own. We had oh a guy gosh. get up and talked about how he was in a child. He was a child when he got married and then two, one on the house floor, two on the Senate floor, the guy on the house floor talked about how he did it and then how his daughter did it also. And so in the house, most people were like, to my surprise, but I was pleasantly surprised. Most of them were like, no, I, I'm with you. This is disgusting. I had yeah. as many bill sponsors as I could. And most of them were Republicans because if I'm going to get a bill signed into law, this year we pass about 300 bills a year. I think like five, maybe five of them were lead sponsored by a Democrat, this was one. And and like three of them were mine because I work really hard. But I always have Republican sponsors on my bills and I got a bunch of Republicans to co-sponsor this. And a lot of them were like, yeah, this is disgusting. It needs to be 18, no exception. But then the roadblocks were not at all what I expected, honestly. Some of them were just like, oh yeah, I got married when I was in high school because I'm, I serve with people that are like 80 years old. And so they were like, this is normal. And I was just like, well, the times are changing. Like it's yeah. not normal yeah. anymore. It's disgusting. And we need to protect children from these like very predatory things. You're right. Most of, most of the marriages are like 16 and 18 year olds or 17 and 19 year olds, thankfully that are like, that are people that met in high school and fell in love and decide to get married and should definitely wait, but like not, I can't make yeah. that decision. So like that is way less predatory than the people that are 18 marrying 35 year olds or 50 year olds. The biggest gap that we had was like a 16 year old boy and a 49 year old woman, I think, because we have the statistics. And so like 
what what's well, going on with a 16 year old teenager and a almost 50 year old adult like that's yeah. disgusting there's no reason where that should that no 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 yeah and so some of the roadblocks were insane so the the verbiage changed from our our marriage code was like really antiquated and because nobody had ever touched it and and so it said a man and a woman shall go fill out the paperwork or whatever and so I just striked it and said two applicants because same-sex marriage is legal federally it's it's supreme court precedents and it's in federal code so like it it Mm -hmm. might not be in west virginia state law but like it's the law and so i just changed it to say both applicants and this crazy group called family policy council who are like the worst people you can they're just like basically like westboro baptist right they're like that and they they got a hold of all they got the bill they talked to all the like, like very conservative people and they were like well, here's what she's actually trying to do. This isn't about child marriage. This is about gay marriage. And she's trying to change the law to make it so gay marriage will always be legal in West Virginia. And I like had, they like paid for ads against me to say that that this bill wasn't about children. It was about gay marriage and same-sex marriage. And they were, and so I had to go talk to them and be like, if, if I were doing that, like, I'll just tell you, I'm Can not, you I don't. I'll just tell you this is what I'm doing. Like, I can't believe that they would even think that. I get what the what the hell are you doing? And so yeah. I was like, that's not what's happening here. If 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 it makes you feel better, we can go back to the other language. But as I'm this is about child marriage. So we yeah. ended up having to go back to the other language oh. and and just keeping in the part about children. So that was like a concession that I was like, okay, okay nothing's changing on my end. So like, okay, we'll do that. And then it, so that was in the house. And I was like, yeah, we'll do that. I had to agree to not talk about the bill on the floor. The, the agreement, what they were like, we can't run the bill because we don't want people to get up and start talking about same sex marriage. And I was like, okay, I don't want that either. Cause we've already like really hurt the LGBTQ community this session. So like, I'm not trying to make this about that because it's not right so like they were like nobody nobody can talk about the bill on the floor like everyone has agreed to not talk about it period we're just gonna pass it you nobody can talk and I was like okay fine like I'm not a grandstander I don't get up and do speeches really so like okay but then one guy got up and he was the guy who had been child he had been in a child marriage and so was his daughter and I think he just wasn't in the loop and he just (laughs) talked about child marriage so like passes the house goes to the senate my the senate is super super republican they run bills it's disgusting they run bills through their own caucus first in the morning they meet at 7 a.m every day and if the bill doesn't pass their caucus they won't run it in committee which is like so not transparent at all that's so messed up but that it's so messed up but that's what they do and so i it's my understanding because i'm not in there that my bill did not make it past their caucus and so the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee put it on the agenda anyways and just didn't tell any of them. And so they all got really mad at him. He doesn't have complete control of his committee because they have elected so many really far right people that that the numbers are kind of skewed. And so he didn't have the numbers in the committee. The bill goes into the committee. It dies in the committee, completely dies. So then like oh, wow. they procedurally... They can't report it to the floor. And, but then on the house floor in the middle of just something else, the chairman gets up and this had clearly been orchestrated, but the chairman gets up and like moves to report the bill with the recommendation that it passes out of the committee. And then immediately the, their majority leader moved the question, which means you couldn't debate it at all. And so they just had to vote. And I guess they had whipped the votes anyways. And so They whipped the votes, they moved it. So then immediately it's like on second reading with like two days left in the session. And I didn't know what was going to happen. And so people were like, what the hell just happened? And we're like, the bill died in the committee, but then he procedurally like brought it back and scared, like nobody knew. And then the next day, one of the guys who was on the crazy side was so mad that he got up and demanded that all the bills be read in their entirety, which is something that you can do. 
Like that's oh a move God. that we always use. Yeah. So you can do it at any point. You can use it to kind of like slow things down. It's an mm -hmm. antiquated rule that's from when people literally were illiterate. And so if you ask that the bills be read, then they have to be read. And like we have speed readers on staff for when this happens because they'll call them in and they'll start speed reading and get through the bills. But this guy's doing it. It's like of... Of 60 days, it's day 59. Oh my god! So we're at the point in the session where like all the bills have already passed both sides. They're just like moving back and forth. Like, do you accept these changes? Do you accept these changes? And he tries right. to do it then. And he gets up and he starts just loses his shit. Starts screaming. I demand that all the bills be read. And they were like, we already read them. Like those... The time for that was a while ago. We already did the three days. Now we're just like dotting the T's, dotting the, you know, dotting the I's, crossing the T's. We're just making sure it's all kosher at the very end. We've already read the bills. Like, you're so out of order. We can't do this anymore. So then one of the other members of the Senate, like, uses some other procedural rule to have the guy kicked out, like, for the whole day. He was taken into police custody for the rest of the day. And then he was allowed back the next day. But I think there's a chance that he might sue the Senate because he was removed and they wouldn't read the bills. But I don't think he will be now. But it it, it was all over the child marriage bill, too. And like I was going to say, this it, man got arrested to protect child marriage. Like, what a hill to die on, my friend. Literally. What yeah, a hill to like... die on. Yeah. And by, between when the bill died in Senate Judiciary, obviously, we made a huge deal about it. We were like... Why are these people voting to protect child marriage? Like one would think it would be a bill that once it got on the agenda that like you kind of can't vote against, right? Like sometimes there's things that people might not personally agree with, but like you can't vote. Ag it's like something that would hurt animals. It's like you're not going to yeah. animals and children like and like law enforcement. It's like we can't all vote against these things. You yeah. just whether even if you want to, you just can't do it. And so but like child marriage really this is the hill to die on and so when it died in that committee we all were just like oh my god why are these people protecting child marriage and it blew up like rolling stone washington post front page of yeah. national news and it's like that's the last place you want to be right so it was crazy backfires like that it's just like well you just put the nail in your own coffin congratulations mazel yeah. have a great day like that type of scenario it's Politics, That's crazy. Man. It was wild. Insane. And, uh, and so many of the moves are like minutia, like literally knowing. I feel like so much of the politics is literally being like, let me just look in the rule book, pull out this random Always. rule and just roll yeah. through it. The and games. Like, yeah. And it's I feel like so games. many people don't know like what's going on. They're like, Why is this not working? Or why is this so late? Or any of these things. It's because people are playing chess, not checkers with each other. Yeah. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, anything we can thing. do to make people more aware of how all, the, like how it works. I feel like so many people want to be involved, but they don't know how. And it's like, well, don't read the rule book because knowing the rules is important, but it's like knowing how to apply them. And just by yeah. reading them, you're not ever going to get there. Like you have to kind of see it happen mm -hmm. and talk through with like attorneys, but making people aware of how these things work. Like I will see a headline and be like, what is going on in Nebraska? Oh my God. And then you like read through it and you're like, oh, it's boring rules. Yeah. But that's, so that's all that's like where the good stuff happens. Mm -hmm. No, that's so true. And such an important political lesson, which we know political <laughs> lessons here on this show. But thank you so much for coming on. This was the West Virginia rundown <clears throat> that we haven't done yet that we definitely need. And so we just appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. This is great. Thank you for all you do. People got to know this stuff. Truly. Likewise. And hello, your TikTok does a great job of that as well. So I'm thank trying. you. <laughs>